thank you very much, Elizabeth. And uh, I'd like to, I'd like to, th I'm not used to, I'm a technician, but I'm not used to working with these things. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, first I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it is a great honor to be asked to give one of the opening talks. And actually the organizers, you know this talk is on risks, risks. And uh, the organizers have certainly taken a risk asking somebody who's a scientist and engineer to talk about something philosophical. Uh, especially, except for Anna Henningsen, who I've worked with for four years. It was her suggestion, so she's taking a risk. But of course the other people don't know who I am, so uh, that's a risk. Uh, you're taking a risk listening to me because I usually talk very fast. So uh, I took a risk of going online and looking in a Swedish dictionary and putting some words in Swedish. So if you see funny words, you may laugh. That's okay. Okay, um, so. Why, why am I giving this talk? Uh, risk, value, and perception. You know, if I look at you and I ask the organizers, there's a, there's a huge mix of people here. As I understood, almost half of you are from museums, conservators, curators, but there are many people, for example, doing uh, historic buildings, conservation of historic buildings, archeology, span and then there are, of course, scientists and engineers. And the question is, why are you all here? This is it's a big mix of people, but I hope you're all here is because you all want to preserve Swedish cultural heritage. But you also know that it's a very complex process and, uh, and that you all want to learn how to do that. And at least I'm very happy that my colleagues are here and I don't see them at the moment. Agnes Brokoff, Agnes, are you here somewhere? Oh, there she is, there they are. And Tessa Luger there. They are going to, they have developed methods to help you go through these complex processes. And, uh, and you know, these are very well established, but you have to realize it took them a number of years to get them to the point where they are now mature and you can use them. And so it's not something you're going to learn very quickly. It's going to take you also a couple of years to get used to the idea of working with these complex issues and figuring out a model. But what I want to talk to you about today, why, why is it so complex? And the reason is, if you look at the title of the talk, it's Risk Management, Value, and Perception. And I think that's one of the things that people forget. You know, risk management, risk analysis, judging values, especially cultural heritage, is very subjective. And perception, your own perception, how you see things, plays a much bigger role than you remember. So. These methods are very important. They're going to help you work your way through these complex issues, but perception plays a big role. And that's what uh, Tessa and, and Agnes will also be, even though they're teaching you methods with numbers, the thing is behind all of that is to try to get you to think of that. And the only thing I'm going to ask you today, just to be, to get out of my talk, is just to have an awareness of what that means. That's that subjective, your own emotions. The way I'm going to do this talk is a little interactive. What I want to do is I just want to play with your perception. We're going to look at these three words, risk, management, value, and perception. And I'm just going to show you some examples. Okay, <clears throat> now I'll stand over here. So, oh, actually I see there's all sorts of screens here. Okay. Uh, this is an artwork and uh, I assume it's watercolor although I can't see from the internet. This is, of course, someone you probably know. There are a lot of risks with this object when it's sitting in the museum. What kinds of risks would this watercolor have? Well, all works of art and all buildings age. And why do they age? Because of the climate in the museum or wherever it's hanging. And, of course, because of light, there's a risk of sunlight or artificial light, water, Water is a problem, especially with a watercolor. Uh, tourists can be a risk, right? What happens if a tourist suddenly trips over something and bangs against this watercolor? Then you have a problem. Vandalism, in the Netherlands we have people who think they are artists, so they, if they damage someone else's art, they are an artist, so vandalism. Even restoring a piece of art is risk. And I'm sure all of you conservators know that you always worry about, am I doing this right? Is it reversible? Am I damaging the object? That's also risk. Okay, now let's go to Carl's home. 
this is a historic building. And if you look at it, some of the risks are the same. <clears throat> you have, again, aging processes. Of course, now you're talking about indoor and outdoor climate. Of course, sunlight on the paint on the walls. Vandalism could be a problem. I don't know if you have that problem in Sweden, but it's a risk. Outdoor climate, if you have a major storm, you have a risk of damage. Tourists walking in and out cause wear and tear that when Carl was there, he was just one person, and I don't know how many friends he had, but he certainly doesn't have thousands of people going through every week. And conservation is also a risk. We have this discussion in the Netherlands. How do you modernize a historic building to make it energy efficient without, without ruining the cultural value? So modernization is also a risk. <coughs> and fire. Of course, fire is also one of those risks that you have to think about. Of course, now fire is always spectacular. Now this is your neighbor, maybe a few hundred kilometers away. This is Windsor Palace several years ago on fire. Okay, there are risks, of course, here. People had developed safety plans, but you know, in terms of risk, yeah, what, which objects do you take out? Where do you start trying to put out the fire? And of course, this is the result. If you don't have, or maybe they had one, but I don't know, uh, some kind of risk analysis and action plan. These are risks, fire, spectacular. Okay, let's go back to the less spectacular. Here's something that's sort of like the watercolor from Carl. It's paper, it's very sensitive. This is 16th century. Uh, uh, this is a accounting ledger, just a, uh, what do they call it in English? Uh, an accountant, you know, they just keep their records. So, all of the same risks that that watercolor had, but now we have, if we're talking about the modern age and uh, uh, things moving fast, well, people are starting to digitalize. But that's also a risk for this object, because how are you going to digit? This is a fairly thick book. How are you going to digitalize this? Are you going to take a 16th? Can you hear me? Okay. Are you taking a 16th century book and pressing it down on some kind of copy machine, or are you going to take it apart and put it back together? Those are risks, or there are risks associated with it. This is a risk. This is in Amsterdam, and there was a much more unfortunate incident in Cologne several years ago with their city archive. This is the risk of human error or human sloppiness or human corruption or however we don't know why it happened. But if you look at this metro station that is being built and this is a street under one of the tunnels which was not properly supported. So this is a protected cityscape. All the houses on that side, the tunnel started to slowly collapse and all those houses started also to collapse and were so badly damaged that people had to leave. And if you remember in Cologne, it happened within five minutes, the entire city archive, archive collapsed into the new subway tunnel, two people died, and a lot of old records were totally destroyed. So, how do you deal with that kind of risk? And then, my original reason for being here, I've been working for four years with Anna Henningsson on vibrations, the risk of vibrations, but we have that problem also in the Netherlands. You have your Stockholm Museum Night or Culture Night or something like that. We have the Night of the Museums. I think that's a Dutch, a Dutch phenomenon which has now spread over the whole world. All the museums are open. We try to get the public in, get the young people in, and we play rock concerts and all sorts of things like that. Now, that's a bit of a problem. We used to have our Queen's Day celebration here on Museum Square. This oval here is the Van Gogh Museum. Just above, that's the rock stage. That's about 30 meters away. Huge rock museum. Music, 50,000 people on, or well, I don't know how many people, but thousands and thousands of people there. And the Van Gogh Museum, of course, with a few, they have a few paintings that are kind of valuable. <coughs> but, of course, that's a vibration question. That's also a question of, is it a problem? Is it a perception problem? Now, our mayor, of course, solved that problem because the last three years he has forbidden concerts here, but not because of the vibrations, just because too many people were leaving lots of garbage and causing too much trouble. But that's still a risk, vibrations. And of course, 
you deal with construction all the time, right near museums in a small country such as ours, or for example, your, many of your museums are concentrated in cities, so vibrations get to be a problem. So now, you get more and more and all these risks, you've seen all these risks, and you think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm going to do this, and you get your hands in your hair, and you... So, but that's also a risk. That's also a risk, if you remember 10 years ago. Theft. Well, actually, this wasn't theft. These guys came with a gun. Okay, how do you plan for that? That's a risk. Okay, so I've just given you an impression of the word risk, and Agnes will help you manage them. Uh, risk, analysis, and management. <coughs> okay, but what, what, is it, what is it now with a risk? What does risk mean? Risk means that if you do something, there's going to be a consequence. And what, it's sort of a general word which you talk about is the consequence is you're going to lose something. And what are you going to lose? And that's what is uh, the basis of what Tessa is working on along with Agnes. At least in cultural heritage, we talk about losing value, whatever that means, physical value or emotional value. But we're, look, we're losing value. So, we've had risk, now what I would like to do is go to the second word. And again, play with your perception. Okay, value. What is value? Okay, here we have that house again, that historic house. Here we also have a very typical architecture, I think, in Sweden, of a house. Here's also a house in Sweden, in Montala or something like that. It's a small villa castle. Now, just a show of hands, you don't have to be embarrassed. Um, let's say you got a budget to restore one of these three. Who would pick Carl's house? Just put your hands up. Okay, who would pick the very typical Swedish house? Okay, and who would put the money into the castle? Who doesn't want to make a decision? <laughs> who needs Tessa's and Agnes's help? <laughs> oh, okay, well, it looks like a lot more, though, well, not every, some of, uh, I'm, this is actually Monday morning, I'm not very wide awake either. But people, okay, you guys, or at least more people decided Carl's house was important. Okay. Here's two buildings in Stockholm, and I have to admit, I forgot what was that one on the left. I think it's the back of a, or the, a building behind a church or something like that. Sorry? I have, a bad, I have a bad year anyway, so it's somewhere in Stockholm. It's a historic, I think it's the back of a historic church or a villa or something like that. And on the right is a very typical, and I think it was 1930s, but you can correct me, Architecture, it's what we, in the Netherlands, we protect certain areas, they're called protected cityscapes. I don't know if it's protected here, but they're both historic. Okay, again, show of hands. You have a certain amount of budget. Who would want to protect, invest in restoring this building on the left, the historic building? Okay, I'm seeing more hands than Carl, anyway. <laughs> On the right, the historic cityscape. Who would want to invest their money in trying to protect the cityscape? Okay. <laughs> now, are my two Dutch colleagues protect cityscapes? So we have a cultural, cultural perception difference here. <laughs> but anyway, there's a little bit more for the choice for the left one and the right one. Now, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. Look at that. Look at in the middle here. You see these windows. And I don't know if it's true, but we do have these situations in the Netherlands. And I actually, looking at, the, looking at the window frames, I can imagine these are historic windows. They are the original glass. This is zooming in. Again, from the photograph, I can't quite tell, but I, at least my guess is at least the building in the back. Those are also the original windows. They are single, in both cases, they are single panes of glass. So in terms of insulation, energy efficiency, they're bad. Who would replace these with 
double glass even if you couldn't see them. You're replacing historic glass with double glass. Who would do that? One or two people. Who would not do that? Ooh, okay. Who would replace this historic glass in these windows with double glass to make it better to live in for the people who are renting or own the apartments? Okay, who would not? Okay, more discussion on the second one. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get the boxing gloves on later and do that. Okay, here we have this watercolor. And here we have a watercolor which I made for a very good friend of mine who was 75 for his birthday. If you had some money to restore one of these, I won't even ask the question. <laughs> okay, here's our book again. Okay, this is a book, this is an older book. It is an accountant's ledger. Here is a much older book. <coughs> Also in the same library, I think. If you had money to restore one of these, the accountant's ledger, 16th century, or the 16th century book on the other side, which one would you do? The, who would restore the one on the left? And who would restore the one on the right? There's just a little bit more on the right than the left, but again, I think everybody needs Tessa and Agnes to make this decision. What if I told you the one on the right is an original first edition Gutenberg Bible? Aha. I won't even ask the question again. Okay, value, value. That's, that's sort of the impressions of value. Now you just notice there's all sorts of things, all sorts of factors that have to do with value. I've sort of implied economic. I just said, how much money do you want to do? I threw in the word historic. I threw in the words people live here or don't live here, or it's the first one social. These are things that Tesla will be mentioning to you. But you notice this is all subjective. Now, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be learning from Agnes and Tessa methods to help you deal with these things. Okay, for example, Agnes will be just giving you talk, the next talk on risk analysis. And you'll be coming up with graphs, numbers, or things like that. Tessa will be looking at value. Now, value is more subject subjective, so you don't really have numbers and things like that, especially if you start considering things that are not economic. But if you look at the form that, I think this is the form you're using, or at least I copied it out of the book, <laughs> plagiarism. She does use words high, middle, and low value. And then there are many descriptive things on how you determine that. So it is sort of a ranking. So what happens is that you've got risk analysis and value analysis, and you've got something, you've got numbers or letters. You're talking about statistics probabilities, when do things happen or not. So, so suddenly you have this whole field of numbers. Yeah, but what do these numbers mean when you're talking about subjectiveness? And that's where I'm going to go to the third word on my slide. This has to do with your own personal perception of value, risks, and things like that. And the whole question is actually, what do, you know, you, these, these methods are very good and I hope you learn them well, but on the other hand, you've got to remember somebody is working with those methods and it's actually you're working with it. So if you start talking about risks and risk of loss, they're asking you what you're willing to risk in terms of loss of valuable. They're asking you what is more valuable than the other thing. And that you, I hope, is not a machine. At least we don't have artificial intelligence yet. Okay, so let's look at the third word, perception. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to, f the first example, now we, you know, we deal with perception in our decision making and risk analysis in our whole daily lives. So I'm going to just ask you the very obvious question, who came here, who flew here today? Okay, who came here in a car? Oh, not very many, so the rest of you walked? Okay, <laughs> Okay. now, Agnes and I, two months ago, flew to Australia for the ICOM CC meeting, triannual 
big international meeting. We flew on Malaysian Airlines flight MH17, where it actually was 16 and they renamed it 17. It flew to Kuala Lumpur. It did not fly, it did not fly over the Ukraine. It did fly over safe countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, but that's a different point. And we landed in Melbourne. Okay, it was the plane was half empty. But if you look at the statistics, and I'm sure everybody has heard this once or twice, your chances of dying in an aircraft accident in a Western, uh, the ones that are the ones that are controlled by the International Civil Aviation Board, not uh, not the ones in the Ukraine or somewhere in Siberia. Your chances are one, almost one in five million that you will die in an airplane crash. Okay? I looked it up. In Sweden, every year... Uh, oh, there's a number missing. That should be four. Four people die per 100,000 people who are in a car. Accident. Okay? So that should be a four on the left, and then it's one in 25,000, because what does that mean? That's a perception thing. One in five million people die in an aircraft plane crash, and one in 25,000. But of course, you know many people, probably your own friends or neighbors, who refuse to get into an airplane. But they will jump in their car to go to the store, which is when most of the accidents happen. That's perception. The perception that you don't have control in an airplane, the perception it's spectacular. When an airplane goes down, 300 people die all at once. That's perception. But everybody's willing to jump in a car. And everybody's willing to buy a lottery ticket. In the Netherlands, you have one in five million chance of winning the big 20 million euro prize every month. Okay, that's perception. Let's look at something else. This is a very busy title, but you know several years ago there was an election in, uh, in one of these countries on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, and there was a guy named Obama and a guy named Romney, but I'm sure you have elections here in Sweden, and this is how people play with you, and they try to mess up your perception. Look at this table. This is sometime in September. It was polls on who's ahead, and then of course the press and the Republicans and the Democrats, they try to twist these numbers. Let's look at these numbers. <clears throat> Let's just take one, this IBD tip survey. 50% of the people said they would vote for Obama. 49% said Romney. And of course, in the news, you see that blue, it says Obama plus one. Yeah, Obama is leading. He's leading the polls. It's an upturn. Okay. Now, there's this funny thing there that says M-O-E, moo. Now, moo is what a cow says, or in Dutch it means you're tired. The margin of error is 3.7. Now, a scientist know what, knows what a margin of error is, but a news reporter and somebody who wants to, wants to turn you, they'll, they'll just sort of, oh, the margin of error is 3.7, but Obama is leading. Now, the difference is one, but the uh, margin of error is almost four. So the difference is smaller than the margin of error, which means there is no difference. Yeah, but it's your perception. That's what the newspapers want to do. That's what the politicians want to do. They want to mess up, mess you up. That's your perception. They're playing with you. Okay. Uh, now, let's, let's go to perception of forms. Tessa and... And yes, are working with formulas and things like that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But let's just sort of think about what happens when you work with a form without really thinking about what you're doing. My boss, way a long time ago, I don't actually come from cultural heritage. I worked in an engine manu jet engine manufacturing company. And my boss was sent to a training course. And one of the things was on decision making. So they did an exercise on decision making. How to choose your new car and I'm sure you've done this as well. Probably not as complicated. There are many factors that you do to choose a car, right? And then some of the factors, now I say waiting. Oh, this is what happens when you work on an Apple and then you come back to a window. So actually, <laughs> uh, 
this, this column of numbers should actually be over here. Okay, so you have a weighting. That's, that's a, which factor is more important than the other one? And then you get a number and a grade. And you know, my boss came up with this car. A very nice car, except that wasn't really the car he wanted. That's what happens when you have perception, when you, when you just blindly go into a form without thinking what you're doing. Okay, this is now my last example of perception. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really see it is, and I can't carry it because it's two meters by a meter. This is a so-called face-mounted photograph. This is more for the museum people. It is a photograph where plexiglass is glued onto the photograph, face-mounted, and it gives the photograph depth and it saturates the color. It makes it look deep. And, what, and of course, the plexiglass is glued to the photograph, which means it is now part of the object, and it's a conservation problem. Conservation ethics, risk. Plexiglass is very easy to scratch, and it's also very easy to damage with chemicals. So conservators are worried about what they do, and so they did lots of experiments, and they asked me as a scientist who was a nerd looking at all sorts of little things, and ooh, that's really cool, and they asked me which one's worse. And one day they came to me with a little sample and said, Bill, there's a big scratch in this one. We need to know how deep it is. So I went on my fancy instrument, and I gave them this plot, and you see this spike. Big spike! deep scratch. But if you look at the scale here, that deep scratch is 0 0.05 micrometers. 0 0.05 micrometers is 0 0.00005 millimeters, which is 50 nanometers. You heard about nanotechnology, nano, 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 nano. Okay, really small. It's about 25 atoms. So I'm busy as a scientist. This is how I first got into the philosophical thing. I'm, I'm, as a scientist, I think, let's see, they found one scratch. It's 25 atoms thick. Can you see it? And that's where I started doubting on what I'm doing. I doubt some of my scientists are busy with atom level research, and I wonder what conservators are busy with. So, but the conservators, and this was Metropolitan Museum of Art, Netherlands Photo Museum. They allowed me, or they were willing to take part in what I did. It's not scientific, but a perception test. And what you see is my own artwork. These are face-mounted photographs, black and white. And we had 13 different treatments and two that were not treated. And I asked people from all walks of life to have a look at them and tell me which was the best and which was the worst treatment. Okay, so first I asked normal people. This is... The first normal person was the director of our institute, and within 30 seconds she said, is this a joke? And she left. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is now the receptionist from our institute. She spent a long time here. Notice she has the form, although the form doesn't have much on there. All you had to do is write. She's there on the form, and she was looking, and she actually turned the lights off. This was in our institute. It's not really good. And it turns out she was more an expert than I thought because, of course, she has grandchildren and she was photoshopping the ki kids' photographs. So she had some idea of what she wanted to see. So she actually turned the light off. But this is a normal person. Yeah? This is a conservator. <laughs> he has a different perception of what he's looking for. Yeah? Okay. And this is me with my metal helmet on looking at deep scratches. Okay, that was my last example of playing with your perception. So, you know, you have what, I, what the message I want to bring is we're going, you're going to spend two days learning two, or well, at least the, the best methods I know of are my own colleagues, but two methods on risk analysis and value, trying to assess value. Okay, you'll be learning methods to get this complex material into something that you can so follow. But what, again, what I want you to leave with you is your own perception is going to play a big role and you've got to remember that while you're doing this. So these methodologies are certainly going to help you in your work trying to do risk analysis, but they're not going to make the decisions for you. And even when you're using the methods, in the middle of the method, you're going to have to make decisions. 
Yeah? Nobody else is going to help you. Okay. It's a balance between numbers or letters and your own perception. You're looking at risk levels and what are you going to accept as a loss of value. Okay, that's all kind of subjective things. And finally, the last thing I noticed that uh, with a lot of people is, you know, people want the lowest risk, but unfortunately, a lot of people think that means no risk. That's not the same thing. Again, it's a perception thing. Oh, low risk means no risk. That's not the same thing. Okay, last thing, what we do in the Netherlands, we start, and it's actually been fairly successful, if I, can, if I may say so myself, we also conduct dialogues. Because, because you can't get a grip on all of these things, we conduct so-called Socratic dialogues. Anna has done one with me. And it has to do with getting people to talk with each other about value, but without its structured so that you cannot attack each other. It's to understand why I think the way I do and why other people think the way they do. Okay, I would like to leave it at that, and I wish you all the success and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.